The race for who occupies Alsa Rock in Abuja has started, with political activities over 2023 general elections gradually picking up prominent Nigerians led by northern elder statesmen are making nationwide consultations to ensure that the political parties, especially the major ones like the People's Democratic Party, PDP, and the All Progressive Congress, APC, field certain presidential candidates in the race. The concern for these prominent Nigerians is to make sure that the South, any of the South, South, Southwest and Southeast, produces the next president of the country in order to continue to sustain the unity of the country and douse the current burning political tension. The group, headed by former top uh, federal government officials, has in the last few days met with former military president General Ibrahim Abangida, uh, retired, uh, former president Olusha Gwabasajo, uh, former heads of state General Yakubu Gowon, retired, and General Abdusalami Abubakar, retired, and traditional rulers and other stakeholders on the need to persuade the political parties to produce certain candidates. 2023 has started in full swing to Lufu. Yeah, but then we keep looking, you know, towards the past. Mm. That roll call, that list of names you just reeled off, for me, is such an uninspiring motley crew. Can we not move forward? <laughs> and that's all I have to say. I'm just so, I find it so tedious. Tedious link. <laughs> well, I, I think, let us put it like this. Look, the question has been asked uh, several times about, is Nigeria a nation? Are we all fully agreed on the terms of the negotiation of the union? Uh, do we all agree that we are just one nation driven by the same kind of values that we see in other countries? What are those values? Unity, nationalism, patriotism, togetherness. Now, what it shows you is that every time Nigeria still continues to negotiate the union, and we have even written into the constitution federal character. We have written into the Constitution what some people interpret as quota system, whereby for you to form a cabinet, people must come from different parts of the uh, country, and there must be representation. Uh, even for university admissions, you have to make sure that even if some students are not so intelligent in some parts of the country, they have to be accommodated so that we can see that we have a country Ashmetia. that works. Now, it's the same thing that we have in politics. And I think that the price we continue to, play, uh, to pay uh, in Nigeria is the fact that, look, anytime you want to choose a leader in Nigeria, the consideration is not competence, it's not experience, it's not ability. You have to do a deal and say, OK, uh, where should he go this time? Where should he go this time? And wherever it goes, you are not necessarily going to choose the right person. And I think that that is one big regard in which the people of Nigeria are short change. The politics of 2023 has been, even before now, before any group of leaders came together, has been about, OK, is there a part of the country that has been short change uh, that should take the lead next time so that we can hold Nigeria together? They are talking about unity. They are talking about Nigeria being together. They are talking about stability. OK, must we keep Nigeria together every time on the basis of negotiation? Is it possible to keep Nigeria together on the basis of the performance of the individuals that show up to lead? You're looking for a meritocracy. And, and that is not, yeah, that's the word, meritocracy. And that is not just at the federal level. How It's also the same challenge at the state level. At the state level, you are looking at local government. And this senatorial district produced somebody the other time. OK, you should go to this senatorial district. And the argument is, that, oh, there are good people everywhere. But some of the best people may just be concentrated somewhere. Yes. At the local government level, it is the same thing. So we have uh, a transactional system of government rather than a government system that is focused on transformation. So for 2023, what is the argument? Now, the one that you have described now says the leader must come, uh, the next president must come from the south, the southern part of Nigeria. And what is the point? There was a south-south, uh, in 1999, there was even that negotiation when we returned to democratic rule. The argument was, oh, the Yoruba people have been offended. Uh, they killed one of their own. Uh, Bashon M. K. Abiola, he won an election. He was denied the election. So let us pacify the Yoruba people.
by getting a president from their region. So we had uh, President uh, Obasanjo. President Obasanjo spent eight years. Oh, some people came and said, ah, this thing must now go to the north. So we had President uh, Yaragua. And it wasn't just President Yaragua coming from the north. They gave it to him, or President Obasanjo gave it to him, because he had a brother, President um, uh, Major General Shehu Yaragua, Yaragua, who had been killed in detention. So the people of Katsina needed to be pacified. So he became president. OK, he took ill. Um, uh, president Jonathan took over from the South South. The North rose in uh, protest that, no, it was the turn of the North. Uh, a South South person should not be allowed. It was not his turn. OK, the rest is history. Then the thing came, went back to the same Katsina. And then we have Pre President uh, Buhari. Now, the Southerners are saying, you denied a South-South person from having uh, our turn because you said it was your turn. Now, in 2023, Igbos are saying, you have never allowed us. Civil war ended uh, in 1970, but Igbos have not been allowed to have a shot at it. This is the problem with Nigeria. And I think Achebe is right when he said, one, that there was once a country, when he said, two, that the problem with Nigeria is that of leadership. Yeah. So the younger generation, people like us, the young uh, people of Nigeria, I know you are looking at me, you think I'm not one of no, the you young people. No, just about. I'm, I'm one of the just young about. No, I'm part of the younger generation. <laughs> we are, are saying, actually. <laughs> we are about. saying <laughs> that the older generation should give us an opportunity to reorganize this country so that this country can be organized on the basis of principles, justice, equity, Progress, competence. I don't care where you come from. If you like, come from uh, Ajangbadi or wherever, right. some okay. funny part of Nigeria. Okay. As long as you can move this country okay. forward, you will be the right candidate okay. for Nigeria. All right. So yeah. all this talk about regionalism okay. and all of that, some people say it's part of our reality, but we need to move ahead. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we'll go to news headlines. Uh, that's all we've got on news headlines. We'll take a short break now. And when we return, we'll have Roto Sudiri, Marco Wilson, and the team give us updates on Africa, COVID-19, coronavirus, and the rest. We'll be right back. All right, it's a pleasure having you back on the morning show. Still there, Rise News Channel. We'll move over to Rotus now. Uh, Rotus, giving us Africa business update this morning. Over to you, Rotus. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Rufai. Good morning, Doctor. And uh, good morning, Tundo. Uh, we start with some troubling um, news out of uh, Zamfara, uh, the state in the northern part of the country, where it seems like you know uh, militants are extorting. Uh, farmers um, for their produce. They're actually making them pay money in order to be allowed to harvest uh, their produce, essentially just uh, taxing them with the threats of violence over in, uh, in Zamfara. We've got a tweet um, here from uh, a, a columnist with uh, uh, Daily Trust, uh, Bulama Bukarti. I think he's also a member of Tony Blair's uh, think tank as well. It says BBC Hausa reports that bandits in Zamfara have stipulated a, quote, harvest fees to the few farmers that manage to cultivate. The farmers have had to pay the gangs to access their farms at the beginning of the season, and now they're denied harvesting until they pay between 300,000 to 900,000 uh, naira uh, per village. You look at the response to his tweets. Uh, this gentleman here says, My village, Yankara, in Faskari, a local government area, among with several communities around, were also asked to pay to allow them a grace period of four weeks to harvest. And then we have another tweet again uh, from uh, Bulama where he says, He's got local information that it isn't just Zamfara farmers that pay these harvest fees. The Ungwalaya village of uh, Beningawari in Kaduna paid one million to harvest their crops. The gang came back, kidnapped some of the farmers and demanded more ransom. Parts of Katina also paid. So, you know, the insecurity, um, what the insecurity threats that are being faced in the country as now they, are, they continue to seep into the harvest for these farmers, which remember are subsistence farmers. I mean, these folks are farming mostly just to, you know, keep themselves above water. And then the little they can sell to the markets, you know, they can. Um, so you can think of what this, ha what this impact this has on the prices of what it is that they're able to harvest if you are, you're affecting supply, essentially. By affecting supply, 
prices are going to uh, increase. Everyone, I think, has noticed that there's been an onion shortage over the last um, uh, month or two in Nigeria. Most of these onions come from some of these states that I've mentioned in the north. Um, and we've been, and we can see the impact on food inflation. If I were going to be getting an inflation update at 11.30 a.m. Uh, today from the Bureau of Statistics, the October inflation numbers, food inflation is at 16.66% right now. And there's every indication that we're going to see an increase in, in inflation um, when these October figures, year-on-year -year inflation for October, uh, comes out. So it's a very troubling development that we're seeing there. Um, insecurity, you know, deters investments and dis disincentivizes those farmers from wanting to be able to produce more. It increases their costs, and it's a problem that um, that the federal government does have to uh, address. Uh, another issue is fuel. Um, the organized uh, private sector has come out uh, to say that they are very troubled by the latest um, increase in the ex depot price. Uh, that the PPMC, uh, Petroleum Products Marketing Company, announced. Uh, in fact, we broke the story uh, on Arise News when this happened. Um, the ex depot price has been increased from 147 naira, 67 kobo per liter, to 155. And that means that the, uh, the, the selling price now is now at 168. I bought fuel at 168 naira per liter over the weekend. So the organized private sector, Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and all the other um, uh, uh, members have come out to say that, look, uh, federal government is being insensitive to the plight of Nigerians. Um, you know, if, if this is going to filter through to inflation. We won't see it in the October numbers, but you know, this is November. We'll probably see it next month when um, inflation figures for November come out in December. Uh, it is going to further squeeze disposable income on the average Nigerian is going to be filtered through to um, supply of goods and services, you know, for you know, pure water, everything else you can think of that is transported by road, which is the general way, mode of transportation for a lot of um, uh, food items and other items in the country. So, but still, on the government side, we've been talking about subsidy now for, for, for years and how they had to deregulate the downstream sector. They've done that. But the problem is the fact that they wasted so much time in bringing out a full deregulation. The exogenous shock of the coronavirus and the tanking of oil prices was bad timing. So now your, your revenues are being you know, squeezed and you've had to force yourself now to get rid of um, fuel subsidies and now increase the price of fuel on the average Nigeria. And this is going to... I mean, second only to the dollar, or maybe you can put them neck and neck. These are the two major um, I, things that affect prices here in this country. You talk about fuel and you talk about um, uh, you know, foreign, foreign exchange. So that's, that's what's going on there. Finally, well, this is a bit of good news. It's still on cars, but we had a, uh, the first locally assembled electric car uh, in Nigeria from the Stallion Group. Uh, Governor Sonwon Lu was at the unveiling. I think it's called a Hyundai Kona. Um, so an EV, of course, at the bottom there is electric vehicle. So the first locally assembled electric vehicle in Nigeria. And well, you know, look, I mean, it's a positive story. However, I know I can expect what you're going to say. You know, we don't have electricity problems in this country, and yet we're unveiling, um, you know, there's the governor, someone Lu there in his, uh, in his mask and his face cap there as the Stallion Group unveils the electric car. Look, I mean, I think, you know, Nigeria has to be able to, despite all our issues with power, you should be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. So while you're still having your power issues, there should, we should, should, should still be able to celebrate a locally assembled vehicle. Um, yeah, you know, it's hard to defend this, but hey, it's still, it's still progress. It provides jobs, and it's, it's a good thing on, as far as seeing this happen. You know, we just have to see that our power issues are solved down the road. This will, this will kind of save money if you think about it. I, I mean, Rotus, I quickly want to jump on this. I'm quite excited, yeah, but not too excited, because what's going to be the knock-on cost on the citizenry? How many people can afford that car? How many people can afford to even get the electricity to power or charge the car? Good range is gone anyway. It's got about 422, uh, 28 kilometers by a single charge that lasts about nine hours. And that can take, so that's a drive from Lagos probably to worry. That, that's, uh, that's about how long it will take you on a, a good nine hour charge. But, but it's a good range. It's, it's, it's a future. It's what we should start looking at. But I think government, too, should be able to come into this and give a lot of subventions to be able to reduce, you know, the cost of getting this. Because they have talked about many things. They've talked about CNG. You know, they talked about converting people's cars to auto gas and the likes right. and with EVs, too. Let's see how that works. Right. I want to talk about the knock-on effect of the fuel price. So this morning, I got asking uh, one of the utility guys that services uh, my apartment, uh, how much did it take him to get from Ikorodu here? He said he, he would normally take about 400, uh, 500 naira from Ikorodu down to VI, 
uh, as at Friday last week. But as of today, it's 800 naira. Wow. So there's been a knock-on effect of 300 naira wow. on the cost of transportation alone just because of the petrol price has increased. And I'm sure transportation costs would increase down the line. I mean, some other bus routes, somebody was telling me the other day, I think as at Friday when the first announcement came out, uh, that to come from Iyanokbaja to Aja now, formerly used to be about 800 naira, but it's over 1,000 naira, yeah. or 1,100 naira, or 200 naira. So that's more costs uh, being passed on to the people. And concerning the farmers, please, I want government to produce them. Uh, onion is now gold in markets. Goodness me. I went out to the market, just two, two seeds, two, two bulbs of onion right. is now 100 naira, which wasn't the case before. Right. Food prices are increasing by the day. And I'm sure when those food inflation numbers come out, it's going to budge on over 16, 17 percent. Right. Please, insecurity, we cannot afford to keep negotiating with Bani. We need to clear out that place for our farmers to be able to breathe. On electric cars, let's start with that. The first person who talked about electric cars at, at the uh, National Assembly of Nigeria was Ben Murray Bruce, mm. when he was senator uh, from Bayesa. Yeah. And when he talked about it, uh, everyone laughed at him. They thought it was a joke. Mm. In fact, he went ahead to even get an electric car to show that it is possible to ride an electric car uh, in Nigeria. But now, with what has happened in Lagos State, with the Stallion Group, that's a group that is now locally assembling uh, that Hyundai um, Kona uh, that you refer to. We see that it is possible here too. In South Africa, you have BMW, you have um, um, Nissan, and you have uh, Tesla. Uh, which is the electric car by uh, Elon Musk. Yeah. And you have all of that in South Africa. In uh, Uganda, you have the Kira car, which is also an electric uh, vehicle. In Ghana, you have the Kantanka. So Nigeria now is uh, joining the race. Yeah. But we are going to hope that what we have, the version we have in Nigeria, will be the hybrid type. Right. Because electricity, as you know, is a major challenge in Nigeria. If you are going on the highway and then a problem uh, occurs, then if you have a hybrid version of it, uh, then you are better off. The second issue will be one of cost. How many people can afford it? This third issue will be one of maintenance. How do you maintain it? Many of our mechanics, they are worse than their colleagues within the West African uh, region. Th these were people who were trained with uh, Pujo in the uh, 1970s, mm -hmm. who were trained with a uh, Volkswagen, the old, uh, you know, uh, models. Right. Do we have the technical capacity to be able to provide, what do they call it, after service, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, opportunities yeah. for those who get those vehicles? Mm -hmm. But of course, what we need to know is that this is where the future is. Okay. Even now, with all these uh, automated vehicles, we don't even have the expertise in terms of mechanical knowledge to be able to manage them or to maintain them. So it's good to think ahead in terms of the future, but is Nigeria prepared? Indeed. Indeed. Right, that, that's a big question. Thank you so much. We'll move on to Michael Wilson in London. Michael, it's a pleasure talking to you this morning. Morning. I have a, um, a, a little question of etiquette for you all. So on the subject of electric cars, it's very nice of you to invite me for dinner, Doctor. Thank you very much indeed. I have my first gin and tonic and I say, Doctor, by the way, do you mind if I plug my car in? And you're thinking... <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering how many dollars that's going to cost me over dinner. It's really nice of you, Doctor. Thank you very much indeed. That's the issue. You, you, you put your finger on it. I mean, this is if only there was something like this. If we had something that was affordable, people would do it. But A, the, our, our electricity network could not take the strain if everybody had an electric car. It simply wouldn't work. So yeah. hybrid's the way forward. But I just thought I'd throw that in. Right, first of all, then, big trade news. Big trade news this morning. Um, Fifteen Asia Pacific nations they've 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 signed this thing called the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. It's RCEP. It's not so much the content of it and what it's going to do. As right, it's not so much what it's going to do. It is the content. Listen to this. It's Australia, New Zealand, Chile, Asia. Um, it got. China, Japan, South Korea, uh, and a single multilateral agreement between all those countries. So that's that's actually quite that's quite a, an impressive thing to, to to get over the line. That kind of size of trade deal. And so naturally speaking, you've got this 
records being set basically in in Asian stocks, particularly um, in in Japan, and also that kind of thing is eclipsing the usual coronavirus worries that we've been going through um, uh, for the for the past year. Really, you know, um, it seems like it's no longer, doesn't it? Um, the Nikkei up two percent, Cosby up two percent, Shanghai Composite up one percent, Hong Kong up half a percent so all that all that kind of trade talk actually and it's been eight years in 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 getting together the fact that it's actually got over the line is an enormous boost for asia because what it says is it says we don't need the united states anymore and that's quite significant as the united states comes into a, a new administration let me tell you through last week and as you know um it was a strong week there was the optimism wasn't the very early in the week about um vaccine and so on uh, and the the fact that at last the u.s uh, election um they, they have a joke here about the u.s election as well that americans say to us what's this game of cricket that you have that goes on for four days or five <laughs> days and there's no result That's and we cricket. say oh, yeah. what about your elections then <laughs> tell that one anyway two factors help drive the 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 s p to a record a record close and and really all these games despite the fact that that all is is not well. Um, financial markets are, as they always do, they're, they're sort of looking ahead of what's going on at the moment, but they ought to be thinking um, about what's actually happening right now. They need to get over the, the present problems. And um, w one of the, the, bio, the BioNTech uh, men, uh, the, their CEO, Tengshka Ugo Sahin, said at the weekend that a, returnal, a return to normal could come by this time next year. Well, we'll see about that. Over the weekend, continues to rampage through the United States, Europe, surging in Latin America, certainly in Mexico uh, and, um, and, 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 in, and in Europe too. As far as Europe's concerned, let me take you through what's happening in Brexit. That seems to go on from week after week, and it's going to go on for this week, and it will probably go into next week as well. They're still stuck on these big fault lines of fishing, state aid, and the rest of it. I expect that that will, uh, that, that, that will continue. They're talking about a new deadline of December the 10th. Um, well, there we go. And any thought that actually, as uh, as uh, Johnson got rid of um, Dominic Cummins, his chief, chief advisor, um, if you think it's they're going to be softer debates, they're saying no, there won't be. It'll be just be as as hard as ever. So um, the, the 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 our prime minister had his unwelcome brush with with COVID early, earlier this year. He's saying this morning he's never felt fitter. They're talking about a new green agenda. So politicians keep talking up the future. You and I may be thinking a little bit more about what's going on right now and how we're going to get over that. Um, that trade agreement I started my report with actually boosted oil prices overnight. Um, and the gold itself has benefited from the dollar being slightly weaker. But if you think that gold is going to leap out of um, its 1889 to, I'm looking at it now, 1896 uh, an ounce, and probably not. It, it might do, but it won't be anything to do with anything at all. It'll just be because it's getting cheaper. Week ahead, US retail sales tomorrow. This is a big one. Um, we'll see th there have been very much a kind of V-shaped recovery in the United States. States, quite extraordinary. Big strength of, as far as consumers are concerned. Big rebound there. Um, and I would draw your attention to two airlines. First of all, here we get EasyJet results tomorrow. Now, EasyJet, if you don't know, is a, there it goes, budget airline. Uh, and uh, they, they are predicted to have a sort of £800 million loss. Bear in mind they had a £50 million profit this time uh, last year. So that's quite interesting. So what is actually happening to airlines? Because this is a very important forward-looking economic factor. Qantas are saying they don't have results today, but they were saying over the weekend that things won't get back to normal for another year. So that, that really is, is your view from the beginning of the week. But those airline stocks, I think, are going to be very interesting indeed. All right. I, I want to quickly talk about unfinancial. I was reading an article in The Economist on Friday, and they were, t and they were talking about the fact that uh, the, the, the Communist Party in China is not just clamping on, on Jack Ma, down on Jack Ma, beg your pardon, as a one-off, but it's clamping down on other big businesses in China to be able to rein them in. I mean, what's your reaction to that? Because I just felt the ad financial clamp that was a one-off, but yeah. and they made well, mention I, of a couple of other businesses that have been clamped down on. 
I think it's very disappointing because big tech is something which Jack Ma is very good at. The problem that the Chinese authorities had with him, as you well know, and we talked about this, didn't we? The worry is that Ant Financial was getting bigger than the National Bank. That's the problem, because people actually quite like this. And it's very difficult to run a country under communist terms when many of those citizens are looking outside the country and saying, Do you know what, we quite like a slice of that. They, they, they have already got a stock market that they treat as a casino. You know, I'm talking not about, you know, big investors. I'm just talking about men and women in the street. They do treat it like a casino. They, they want all that kind of thing. It was exactly the same when East Germans looked over the Berlin Wall before it fell in 1989. They were looking at, they could see the Coca-Cola ads over the wall. They could see the television station I worked for, Sky News. They could watch this kind of stuff, but they couldn't have part of it. You, they want to have part of that. I think that if the Chinese authorities, and they can, they can do exactly what they like but if they're crushing the likes of jack ma it doesn't say a lot to entrepreneurs younger entrepreneurs behind him who are going to let's hope why why are they not developing batteries for electric cars we don't know maybe they are we talked about oh, we talked about peak oil we talked about alternative energy um uh, pr proposals and policies are those kids working on those and when they get too big Will the government clamp down on them? That is the disappointing thing. I, I hope it doesn't happen, but I fear it might. I would like you to comment uh, quickly on the implications of um, uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson now saying he has been pinged and he has to go into isolation. I think it looks like a difficult time. Um, implications for Brexit, for the lockdown, for engagement with the uh, House of Commons. Uh, some people are even now proposing that maybe we have to engage uh, the House of Commons uh, uh, virtually. Uh, what do you think are the implications? And considering the fact that he earlier came down with uh, COVID-19, are there things that we need to worry about? Yeah, definitely. I think I think the, wor the world is full of worries and the no no nothing is certain about this. House of Commons virtual, yes, I think it's probably quite a good idea. I mean, I, I know a member of the House of Lords who actually is vote, watches the debates on home and she actually votes, you know, from home. Uh, and I think that's, that's probably what we have to do. It does cut away at the rough and tumble of things. It's very difficult to know what's going on uh, in number 10 Downing Street as we speak. Um, there's obviously been a big big turnaround there. Let's hope it's for the better. I happen to like collegiate government a bit more than somebody, just a, a cabal of a, a few people, including Yoko Ono telling us what to do, as we were saying on Friday, you know. I, I, I don't like that. I prefer, I, I think a prime minister has a job. I think a cabinet has a job. And I think that power should be devolved to that cabinet, to their various departments, to do it, best, to do it in, in, the, in the best way possible. If that's the way forward, then that would be constructive. I can't answer your question directly. I can only say that's what... I think my hopes and the hopes of most of the people um, in this country are right now. Well, right. I never blamed Yoko. I blamed John. <laughs> All right. Yeah, okay. I must have to say, I, Michael, I, 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 this morning, I, I, your one-liners <laughs> and zingers are like coronavirus vaccines. All right. I didn't saw anything on the vaccines this morning. Good morning, Rafai. Good morning, Dr. Abbasian. Good morning, Tundu. Um, nothing much on the vaccines. Uh, just something that Michael had mentioned previously about one of the scientists behind the most promising vaccine, that would be BioNTech. Uh, we are hearing some news that it can actually have that uh, reduced transmission by 50 percent. But we'll get into that in just a moment. Let's just look at the global figures uh, this morning, according to the Johns Hopkins University tally. Uh, currently, we have surpassed 1.3 million deaths globally. Also, there are now over 54 million people infected with the coronavirus globally. Over the weekend, the world also registered its highest COVID-19 cases in one day, uh, and that was on Saturday. The figure was 660,905. It surpassed the previous set's highest daily total of cases, which was on the 7th of November this year. If you look at the daily graph as well, it shows us a picture of how many cases we had just yesterday and the number of deaths. Um, but away from these numbers, let's talk about the US because the virus is running rampant through America and Europe. Uh, America surpassed 11 million cases 
uh, already. The latest milestone comes just six days after it recorded 10 million cases. That means it took America six days to record one million additional coronavirus cases. That's huge. And with President Trump refusing to concede, uh, that comes with lack of access to vital information and everything else for the Biden administration. So uh, President-elect Joe Biden's coronavirus advisors are planning to meet directly with the leading drug companies uh, developing coronavirus vaccines this week. According to his chief of staff, Ron Klain, he says that they'll be making, meeting those drug makers directly. And we know that Pfizer tops the list of the drug makers they are planning to meet this week. So we'll see how that meeting goes really for them and what difference it can make. And speaking about um, Pfizer, we do know they have a vaccine with BioNTech, uh, what I was referring to earlier. Uh, Professor Ugo Sahin, who is the co-founder of BioNTech, said that the vaccine, they now know from further analysis that the vaccine can reduce transmission by 50%. Uh, last week, you recall that the preliminary analysis showed that the vaccine uh, was, uh, could, by 90%, effectively stop people from catching COVID-19, which, which was fantastic news for everyone, including the markets, like Michael had said. Uh, but there are still many crucial questions regarding the efficacy of this vaccine. There's no data yet to show us how well it works with those who need it the most, talking about the elderly. Uh, we don't know how many times we would have to take it, how long immunity would last. Are we going to take it yearly, every two years or five years? So many things we do not know, but hopefully in coming weeks and months, there'll be clearer picture as to how this vaccine works. And of course, you've also mentioned it's not the best of time for the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, who is dealing with bitter infighting at number 10 and starting the crunch week in the Brexit process in self-isolation after meeting with the MP for Ashfield Lee Anderson, who has now tested positive for COVID-19. Now, the Prime Minister was contacted by the NHS test and trace on Sunday. We hear it's not showing any symptoms. There's a, 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 a lot of questions here as well. Um, um, this will show, her, show us, we do know that he's not showing symptoms, we don't know if he's infected yet, we just know he's in self-isolation, but it will show us how long immunity will last should he get infected. Uh, we also know if this will be severe, should he get infected. So uh, a lot of eyes are on Prime Minister Boris Johnson, who is self-isolating. Elsewhere, we do know uh, we do now, uh, we have confirmation as to why the president of Algeria has to travel to Germany. Uh, you will recall that late in October, he was transferred to Germany and his office released a statement saying that he was going for medical examination. But over the weekend, uh, we got news that he was actually being treated for coronavirus. He has completed his uh, tr treatment, but he is now on that what they call post-treatment uh, examination. And finally, as virus surges in Europe, uh, resistance to new restrictions are also surging. Yesterday, we saw Catholics uh, holding an open air mass in the French city of Nantes to protest the COVID-19 restrictions, which came into effect October 30, banning public, large public gatherings in all religious venues. They are saying that the churches have the ability to put in place protocols to, pre to prevent infections from spreading, and they are being cut of the religious food that they need, so they would like to come back to church and hold their mass. Thank you, Adeswa. I also wonder about Boris Johnson. I'm, I hate to sound like I don't have any compassion for him. Of course I do. I hope he doesn't um, catch the virus again. But I wonder if he will because of the antibodies. You'll recall that there's been a lot of debate as to how long immunity lasts after catching the virus. And some people have claimed that there is no immunity because you can get positive COVID test results in quick succession. So what do you think? Are those false positives? What, where, where do you stand on that theory of how long your antibodies protect you from all the T cells? I don't think there's one answer to this, Sundu. When you look at what scientists have said, um, I think for every individual, it is different. So uh, we cannot truly say how long this immunity will last. We've seen people who have been reinfected with COVID-19, and in some cases, it's more severe than their first, uh, first infection. So we really cannot tell, and I can tell you that a lot of people are watching out to see uh, what will happen to Prime Minister Boris Johnson, because he was in a meeting on Thursday with his Prime Minister for just 35 minutes. 
That's well, about how long it takes. On the U.S., we're just waiting for the General Services Administration to officially announce the election, particularly now that the uh, Election Council, the Federal Election Coordinating Council, has said, look, there is no fraud, there is no, uh, you know, manipulation. And that is important. But until that is done, President Trump is holding on to the transition. And that has implications mm. for the progress of the mm -hmm. United States. All right, all right.